Take your Bibles and turn with me, please, to Acts chapter 20. And in just a moment, I'll read, uh, start reading from verse 13. And I really appreciate uh, Dr. Aiken. He has preached for me. I've been in two churches now for the last 26 uh, years. I've been in four churches. I've been a senior pastor for the last 34 years. And uh, the last two, uh, he has preached for me and done a great job. Our people love when uh, Dr. Aiken comes. And we just appreciate him and Charlotte and their boys and thank God for them. And it's been neat to see our kids grow up and uh, have these grandbabies. And I thank God for that. I want to talk to you a little bit about leadership today. And I know that uh, some of you are uh, really, maybe you're just about to be through with seminary or maybe you've just started. Uh, I want to ask you, do you, have you really thought about the kind of leader you are? Every person is a leader because leadership is influence and every one of you influences someone at some level. So if you influence other people, you need to do it in the right way. Are you going to leave the right kind of legacy as a leader? I want to talk to you today about legacy leaders. The text that we're in, I'm preaching through the book of Acts at uh, Bellevue and we have come to the point at Bellevue in Acts chapter 20 where Paul is through with his ministry in the east. He is about to leave Achaia. He's about to leave Asia. He's about to leave Macedonia. And he's about, in his mind, to go to Spain by way of Rome. But he is being sovereignly, supernaturally, spiritually drawn to Jerusalem, just like Jesus was. And uh, he's on his way there, and he passes by Ephesus where he had this amazing ministry. And he calls for the elders of Ephesus to come meet him at a little town right there on the coast in Miletus. And I want to talk to you about that. And I want to give you just a few things about what it means to be a legacy leader. What kind of legacy will you leave? When people look at you and they think about you, when it's your time to go be with Jesus, what will you have left behind in the wake of your life? Think about that. That's a very important, and by the way, this is not a dress rehearsal that you're going through. This is all you get. You're in, you're in life right now. Everything you're doing is part of the legacy that you're going to leave. What kind of legacy? I'm not talking about a name for yourself. That's far from what I'm talking about, but what are you going to leave behind? What is the world going to be like because you lived and Jesus saved you and Jesus filled you with his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave you spiritual gifts, gave you the power, gave you the unction. You had all these opportunities. What are you going to leave behind? Well, let's see what Paul was leaving behind there in the eastern part of the provinces and see exactly what it means to be a legacy leader. First of all, a legacy leader is a leader influencer. He, he influences other leaders. Look at verse 17. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus, he called to him the elders of the church, the pastors of the church. He had spent three amazing, miraculous, productive years in Ephesus. During those years, many people got saved. Many churches were planted. God raised up a lot of leaders. And so he is calling these elders to come to this beautiful coastal town. I've stayed there. My wife and I stayed there one time. It is absolutely gorgeous. And these elders, these pastors loved Paul. They gladly came to see the man who had led them to Christ and who had mentored them in the ministry. And once they got there, Paul reminded them of his ministry in their midst. Look at verse 18. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time. I was serving the Lord, now watch this, with humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. He said, I served among the Jews. They basically rejected the gospel. I was with them for three months in the synagogue and I witnessed to them but they rejected it. Then I went on and witnessed to the Gentiles and many people have been saved, but I, you saw how I served you. I served you like Christ. I served you with humility. I served you with tears and I served you with trials. And Jesus had all of that. Paul wanted to be like Jesus 
and he was a legacy leader because he was a leader of influencers. Are you going to be a leader influencer yourself? I preached recently, in fact, last Wednesday night at my first church in First Baptist Milan, Tennessee. It's where I was a youth pastor. There was a man there named Denzel Dukes. You don't know that name. Probably any of you know that name, but it means a lot to me. That name does because he took me in. I was 19 years old when I went on staff there. And Brother Dukes was just a simple guy. He didn't have any kind of PhD or a D-man or anything like that. He, he had been to Southern Seminary, but he was a faithful pastor of a church, county seat church, about 400 people. And he took me in. And every time he, he would think about it, he would just take me with him to go hospital visiting. And I would visit people in hospital. He told me what to do, what not to do. He told me, and we would go and visit shut-ins. We would go and visit nursing homes. He'd take me on soul-winning visits. He'd take me on to deacons meeting. Uh, he would take me with him when he would do a wedding, and he would talk to me about it after it was over with. He would take me to do funerals, and I would watch that and, and see how he did it. And then what was really neat is he let me preach every other Sunday night at church. And I, that's where I started really preaching, where I sensed the call to preach. And I, you don't know Denzel Dukes, but boy, he means a lot to me because he took me in. He was a great influence on my life. I learned ministry from him. He influenced me. The fact is, you are going to influence somebody in the ministry. Leadership is influence. Everyone influences someone in some way. The question is, how are you going to be thought of? How are the people you're influencing going to think about you later on? Will they say, you know what? I love the Lord more because of you. I pray more effectively and fervently. I live in my Bible. I learned to love my Bible and live in my Bible because of that person. I love the church. I love the Lord's work in the church and I love to help other people and I share the gospel and I'm kind to other people even when they're not kind to me and I am faithful to my family. Are you influencing and leading someone else? Will you lead them to love Jesus more and to love people more? A legacy leader, first of all, is a leader influencer. Secondly is this. A legacy leader is a gospel sharer. If you don't share the gospel while you're in seminary, you won't share the gospel when you get out of seminary. Look at verse 20. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you, notice, publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul taught the gospel, preached the gospel, proclaimed the gospel both publicly and privately. He was doing it publicly in the synagogue. And after three months, they ran him off. They blasphemed against the name of Jesus. So he goes next door, down the street, wherever it was, to the hallway of Tyrannus, a local philosopher. In Tyrannus, that sounds like tyrant, doesn't it? That's exactly what it meant. And some people think that the students had given that philosopher his name. That, you're supposed to laugh right there. Anyway, anyway. And maybe, maybe there's a Tyrannus here on staff. I don't know. But anyway, uh, Tyrannus would let Paul have his philosophy house during the heat of the day from 11 in the morning until 4 at night. Now, Paul would work in the leather shop, that is the tent shop, from six in the morning until 11. Then he'd go to the hallway of Tyrannus and for five hours he would lecture and teach and then from about four o'clock when Tyrannus would take it back over, Paul would go back to the sweatshop, back to the leather shop and work for another two hours. He worked 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And we complain about having a 40 hour work week. Paul said, no, I work 72 hours. I work 72 hours and I share the gospel. I did it in the synagogue. I did it in the, in the speaking house, the, the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And the Bible says, how, how effective was that by the way? 
In just two years of him doing that, Acts 19 verse 10 says, this took place for two years so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greek. Everybody heard the gospel. They'd come to town and they'd say, hey, have you heard that guy, that Christian guy, that, that follower of Christ guy that's speaking over there in the hall of Tyrannus? And they would go and many of them would get saved and they'd go back and they'd get baptized and they'd plant churches. In fact, I just got through reading the book of Revelation, got, just got through reading the New Testament through and all the churches there in the first part of Revelation, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, not to mention Colossae, were found during that time there Paul was in Ephesus. In only three years, the whole area that knew nothing about the gospel in three years was totally evangelized. People were hearing the gospel. They were being saved. Why? Because Paul knew a legacy leader is a gospel sharer. This past Saturday morning, my wife and I, we've been married 37 years. We went out and knocked on about a dozen doors and we had a little gift bag from Bellevue and we had a little uh, a movie in there called the Jesus movie that's been seen by over a billion people in the world and we walked up and we had a little bag of popcorn in there for their microwave so they could eat it and it, you know if we'd really been serious we would have put some peanut M&Ms in there to go with it but anyway we, we went up knocked on the door and said hi I'm Steve Gaines from Bellevue Baptist Church we're in the neighborhood we're praying for people we're also giving away these gift bags we'd like to give this to you and uh, it's got the Jesus movie in it we'd love to see you uh, look at that is there any way we can pray for you I got to share the gospel twice, didn't lead anybody to Christ, spread a lot of seed, other teams went, other people saw people get saved. We sent out about 1,500 people. We worked with 30 churches last Saturday. We went all over, we did about 55 projects all over Memphis sharing Jesus Christ and people would ask us, why are you doing these projects? Why are you serving us? We'd say, because we love the Lord Jesus and we'd share the gospel. Can I just make a statement? If we will share the gospel, people will get saved. Are you telling people about Jesus? You're not a leader if you don't tell people about Jesus. You're not a Christian leader if you're not telling people about the Lord. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You need to pray for lost people. Do you have a list of lost people that you pray for every day? Pray for them to be convicted, to be converted, and for God to send them a contact. Now let that contact be you. And don't just pray for lost people. Share your testimony. Kind of like the guy that said, once I was blind, now I can see. What do people do with that? You've got a personal testimony. And then share the gospel with them. Tell them that Jesus, that God loves you, but you're a sinner and you need to be saved. You need to repent. You need to believe. You need to receive Christ and encourage them to do that. The Bible says that Paul was persuading people to do that daily. He was dialoguing, dialogamai with people and then carry a gospel track. I love to carry the little gospel track by Billy Graham, Steps to Peace with God. And then invite people to church, do all or any of the above, but every day have your heart focused on being a gospel sharer. That's a legacy leader. Number three, a legacy leader is also a task completer. He doesn't just, or she doesn't just start something, but they finish it. Look at verse 22. And now behold, bound in spirit, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. Paul, like Jesus, was on the way to Jerusalem. And everywhere he would go, a prophet would say to him, hey, you go on if you want to, but Holy Spirit's saying, you're gonna have chains, you're gonna have persecution, but you know what? None of that deterred Paul. He was determined to finish the mission. Look at verse 24, but I do not consider my life. Oh, you need to get to this place. I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus. To do what, Paul? To testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Paul wasn't playing it safe. Paul was not interested in preserving Paul. Paul was interested in sharing the gospel, testifying of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then Paul drops a bombshell on them in verse 25. Now behold, I know that all of you among whom I've been preaching the kingdom here, over here in the east, all of you 
will no longer see my face. What he was saying is, I'm on my way, go read Romans 15. I'm on my way to Spain. I'm gonna stop by Rome on the way, but I'm not gonna stay there because I'm an apostle. I don't wanna start churches and plant churches where other people have already started churches. I wanna go to Spain. That's the westernmost part of the Roman Empire. There's no gospel in Spain. Over in Spain, they don't speak Greek so much, they speak Latin, and I gotta bone up on my Latin a little bit, but I'm ready to go. But before I do it all, I've gotta go to Jerusalem. I've got to go to Jerusalem. Paul was a man on mission. Look at verse 26. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. What's that all about? Paul was saying, I've preached all of the gospel to all of the people, and I'm innocent of the blood of all men. It goes back to something that God said to Ezekiel twice one time in chapter 3, one time in chapter 33, but I'll just read out of chapter 3. Son of man, I have appointed you a watchman of the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, warn them from me. When I say to the wicked, you will surely die, and you don't warn him or speak out to warn the wicked from his wicked way, that he may live, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you have warned the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered yourself. I've heard some people say, well, that's not what that applies to. Well, F.F. F. Bruce says it does and John Stott says it does. And you know what? I believe it does. I'll just go with F.F. F. on that if you don't mind. Paul had delivered the complete word to everybody and he said, I don't have any blood on my hands. When you don't share the gospel with people around you, yes, they will die and go to hell if they don't receive Christ, but their blood will be on your hands when you stand before God at the judgment. Do you have blood on your hands with your relatives? Some of you have lost siblings, lost parents, lost people in your family. Are you praying for them? Jesus prayed so fervently in the Garden of Gethsemane, he broke a sweat. When's the last time you prayed so fervently for lost people that you broke a sweat? Jesus Christ is our model. Paul is a great example. What what has God called you to do with your life? Be a task completer. Just just say, I I wanna, when I leave this school, if there's anybody I've come in contact with that I didn't share the gospel with, oh God, help me to be able before I leave Southeastern to share the gospel with the people around me. I don't want blood on my hands. I want to finish the task. Lord, if you want me to be a prayer warrior, a soul winner, I know you do, a generous giver, I know that's of you. Lord, if you want me to go on mission trips, if you want me to be a disciple maker and mentor new believers, God, let me get about it. Lord, let me serve the church. Let me serve in the church and through the church while I'm here. I want to say this to you. If you don't serve in the church now, you're probably not going to serve in the church later on. This is not a time just to read books. This is a time to be actively involved, serving the Lord Jesus Christ and being a task completer. That's a legacy leader. Number four, a legacy leader is a flock protector. Oh, he loves the church. He loves the sheep. Look at verse 28. Be on guard for yourselves, he tells these elders. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Be on guard. Turn your mind to, be concerned about, care for, devote yourself to, devote yourself to the flock. Here is what pastors need to focus on He says, guard yourselves and then guard the church. Guard yourselves and for all the floor. Guard yourselves. Stay close to Jesus. Stay pure. Stay clean before Jesus. Walk with Jesus in a circumspect way, and then be on guard for the flock. Watch for the Christians around you. Be their overseers. The Holy Spirit has made you them their overseer, episkopos, their spiritual guardians, if you will, by the help of the Lord. He has made you their shepherd. He has purchased purchased them with his own blood. You are to shepherd them, poimino, to herd them, to feed them, to guide them, to look after them, to protect them, to supervise them. God wants you to take care of your children churches. And then he says in verse 29, I know that after my departure, there are going to be some savage wolves which will come in among you, not sparing the flock. 
And from among your own selves also, men will arise speaking perverse things, diastrepho, crooked things, to draw away the disciples. After. He said, when I leave you, guys just understand, the devil is gonna attack the church. He's gonna come from without. He's gonna come from within. He's gonna be attacking both ways. Savage people, wolves are gonna come after you. You've got to be shepherds. Don't be hirelings like Jesus talked about in John 10. You be a shepherd. Don't you flee. You protect the flock. You love the Lord's church. Therefore, verse 31, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. Oh, do you love the flock of God? Are you a flock protector? Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? I want to say this, I'm grateful to God for any ministry out there, but I am a local church man. I'm a local church man, and I got news for you. The local church is more important to the kingdom of God than any other organization out there, any other ministry out there. I'm not knocking anybody. I'm just telling you, I just got through reading through Revelation. Jesus was walking around in the lampstands. That's the church. That's the church. Jesus loves the church. The body of Christ is part of Christ, and I thank God for the church. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I'm not knocking any other ministry. I am saying this, that Jesus wants you to love his church. Don't talk about loving Jesus if you don't love his church. That's saying, I love you, Lord, but I don't love your bride. You know what? Any man, somebody came up to them and said, well, I like you, but I don't like your bride. That man wouldn't like that person very much. Amen? So you need to love the church. Jesus died for the church. Jesus wants you to be a legacy leader and that involves you being a flock protector. Number five, be a Bible believer if you wanna be a legacy leader. Very quickly, my, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is verse 32, a great memory verse, by the way. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are set apart, sanctified, I commend you, paratithomy, to give over, to entrust. I, I commit you. I commit you to the word of grace. I commit you to the word of God. I'm leaving you, but the word of God is not leaving you. It will build you up. It will make you spiritually strong. It will give you an eternal reward, an inheritance among all the other Christians who are sanctified and set apart for Jesus Christ. Oh, the word of God builds us up. Danny said, I'm sorry, Dr. Aiken said, <laughs> said that we just had our 11th grandbaby and born like a week or two ago. And our kids, I'm telling them, they're just having kids all the time. It's like we answer the phone and we say, are you pregnant? I mean, it's just, it's just all the time. And every time you turn around. And so, and so we, we uh, this new one is Ainsley. She's a precious little girl and she loves milk. I mean, she loves milk. Why? She's a baby. And the way she loves milk is the way you ought to love the Bible. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, listen to this. Like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. The more you read the Bible, the more it reads you, and the more it reads you, the more you want to read the Bible. And you can't get enough. It's like licking salt if you're thirsty. You just want more. You know, it's like, I got to have more Bible. I got to have more of the Word. I can't get enough. I want to read it. I want to study it. I want to memorize it. I want to meditate on it. I want to pray it. I want to believe it. I want to trust it. And I want God to let me be really part of what he's doing. Uh, this, this, this man of God was, was a man who believed the Word. Number six. A legacy leader is not only a Bible believer, but he's a diligent worker. Hey, look at me just a minute. Don't be lazy. Not an amen in the bunch. I'll give you another shot at it. I was preaching one time in a country church. Nobody was saying amen. I went down, Brother Danny, and I looked up back up at the pulpit, and I said, amen. And I came back up and kept reading, Amen. I knew good preaching when I heard it. Amen. All right. That's right. They wouldn't do it. I'll do it. So I'm going to give you another shot. 
don't be lazy. Amen. Amen. Don't be lazy. Paul was a diligent. Look at this. He said, I've coveted no one's silver, gold, or clothes. You know, John the Baptist had one set of clothes. Jesus had one set of clothes. Don't be enamored by all that stuff. Don't be caught up in style and all that stuff, gold and all these. Don't get into possessions. Don't get into all that. It says in 1 Peter with ladies, don't be wrapped up in how you do your hair and how you wear and all this. Have that gentle and quiet spirit. That's the spirit of God in you, which is precious in the sight of God. Same thing for men. Don't be caught up in things. Love not the world, nor the things in the world, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It's not from the Father. It's from the world, and the world's passing away, and thus they're up. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. I'm telling you, you, don't, you can't love things and love Jesus the way you're supposed to simultaneously. Can't do it. Can't do it. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. Paul was a worker. You know, I was preaching through that text in Acts 19 when he was at Ephesus that they would take, let me just read it to you. This, this is awesome. Listen, Acts 19, 11, 12. God was performing extraordinary miracles. Everybody say extraordinary miracles. Very good. By the hands of Paul. So that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out. Can you imagine being, being paralyzed and you're down and you've never, you can't, you can't. I didn't plan this, but anyway. I did. <laughs> you're paralyzed and they put a sweat rag on you and you lift up. Can you fathom that? He said, what that's all about? I don't know all that's about, but I want to tell you what I think it is. Paul worked, worked, worked. He, did, he worked seven, six days a week. He worked in the sweatshop. He worked in Tyrannus Hall. He worked all the time. And God valued, those were his sweat rags that they were taking there. They were his, not just his little ban, bandana that he was looking cool. He was literally sweating. You know, some people wear a sweat rag and they never sweat. This guy was sweating and they would lay it on the people and demons would come out. I just believe God honors work. He honors work. And I want to say this to you. If you can work, if you're able to work mentally and physically, you need to be working for the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be lazy. The Bible says that God wants us to work, 1 Thessalonians 4.11, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your own hands just as we commanded you. Did you see that? God says attend to your own. Did anybody ever told you to mind your own business? Don't get mad at them. They're just quoting scripture. <laughs> 2 Thessalonians 3, for even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, they're able to, but they're not willing to, then he is not to eat either. I got news for you. If you're just lazy, the government doesn't owe you anything and the church doesn't owe you anything. Go to work. Nobody owes you anything. If you're able to work, God wants you to work. He wants you to work six days a week and rest on one. Just a thought. Legacy leader doesn't have to back up when he takes his paycheck. He's a diligent worker. Number seven, you say, how many more are there? Don't worry about it. <laughs> but there's two. I'll be sweet. I'll be sweet. I want to be filled with the Spirit while I'm doing this. All right, verse 36. A legacy leader is a prayer warrior. Look at verse 36. When he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Paul was no stranger to prayer. One of the great things about studying through the book of Acts is to see how many times Paul spent in prayer. You know, I'm going to tell you this, guys. If you don't pray, you're missing it. Prayer is not all that you're to do, but to me, until you've prayed, you can't do anything more important than pray. And there's just something about prayer. And, and I'll just say this to you. If you love somebody, you talk with them, right? I've been gone from home about a little over 24 hours. I've called my wife like four or five times. I just love to hear her voice. I just love to hear her voice. Why? I love her. I'm not trying to impress you. I've been married 37 years. I've been falling in love with the same woman now for 37 years. I love her and I enjoy talking with her. And if you love Jesus, you're going to talk with him. And if you don't talk with him, I don't care what you say. I don't care how many books you've read or what you've done. You really don't love him the way you should. 
And by the way, if you love somebody, you talk about them too. That's evangelism when it comes to Jesus. So if you're not praying and witnessing, there's something wrong with your love walk with Jesus. And he, he says here, we need to, to pray. He knelt down with him. Spurgeon, oh, what a great man of, in the pulpit. Oh, Spurgeon, you're a great man. You preached for 40 years to 6,000 in London. Yeah, but did you know how the man prayed? He prayed all the time. He said this about the prayer meeting. He said, oh yes, the prayer meeting. It's the place to meet with the Holy Ghost. And this is the way to get his mighty power, prayer. If we would have him, we must meet in greater numbers. We must pray with greater fervency. We must watch with greater earnestness and believe with firmer steadfastness. The prayer meeting, all the prayer meeting is the appointed place for the reception of the power of Almighty God. Do you have a prayer meeting in your church? Do you have prayer meetings all over this campus? Do you have prayer partners? Are you praying? Have you prayed today? A day without prayer is a wasted day. Until you've prayed, you've wasted your day. I'm encouraging you. You say, well, you don't understand how busy we are. Hey, I, I can imagine. I can imagine how busy you are. And I'll tell you this, if you'll go to bed on time, you'll get up on time. If you get up on time, you'll have time to pray. You don't have time to do everything everybody wants you to do. You don't have time to do everything you think you ought to do, but you have time to do what God wants you to do, and God wants you to pray. Don't tell God you're too busy to pray. He'll give you a lot of time. You need to pray. Ephesians 6, 18, pray in the Spirit at all times, on every occasion, stay alert, be persistent in your prayers all believer, for all believers everywhere. Colossians 4, 2, devote yourselves to prayer. Oh, if you won't talk with Jesus, he will not let you lead his people. Number eight, finally, a legacy leader is a legacy lever. He's going to leave a legacy that's a good one. Look at verse 37, and they began to weep aloud. I wonder if you left your church if people would weep aloud. I wonder, I wonder if, you, if they would weep aloud and embrace you and repeatedly kissed him, he said. Grieving especially over the word which he had spoken that they would not see his face again and they were accompanying him to the ship. Paul left them, they never saw him again, but boy, what a legacy he left behind. His legacy was not a name on a building. His legacy was not a chapel named after him. I don't know who this chapel's named after, so I'm not saying, talking about anybody. His legacy was not a plaque on the wall. His legacy was saved souls and changed lives. People were healed because of him and his ministry. People were saved, demons were driven out, areas were changed, churches were planted, in fact, in, how can you explain the book of Acts? In 30 years, they reached the whole Roman Empire with the gospel. And it's taken us forever to reach our little areas. They had something. They were involved in something. They had, a, they had something, President. They had something, Brother Danny, that, that we're, not, we're not doing. I don't, know, I don't know all that it is. But I want to be more like them. I want to leave that kind of legacy. I want to leave behind godly people like that. Danny didn't tell you, but I'm about to turn 60. No big deal. I was just 20 the other day. You'll know what that's about. I had little kids around me just the other day. Now I've got their little kids around me. And I think about what it's going to be like to see Jesus. I think about that a lot. Lord, is the world any better because I was there? Did the kingdom advance because I was there? Or was I on my mission or yours? Was I doing my thing or your thing? I would just encourage you to think about the leader you are. You are a leader. You have influence with someone. In fact, you have influence with people that would never be influenced by me. So you're leading some people. How are you going to lead? Make sure if you want to be a good leader, and this is the last thing I'll say, make sure if you want to lead others that you're being led. 
by the Lord. He leadeth me. Oh, blessed thought. Oh, words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. And when on earth my task is done, when by his grace the victory is won, in death's cold wave I will not flee since God through Jordan leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me by his own hand. He leadeth me his faithful follower I would be, for by his hand Jesus leadeth me. Amen. God, would you just make us legacy leaders in Jesus name and if you agree say amen